Okay, welcome back to video number two in this uh, What's in Our Bag series that we're doing here. So last week we took Bill's bag apart, we opened it up, went through everything in there and kind of went through why he has what he has and what he has and uh, shared that information. And this week we're going to do the same with my stuff. Yeah, there's quite an impressive array of gear in front of me that you can't see. But uh, we have, uh, well, let's, let's look at this. So here, now this feels so different than the Nikon. Yeah, it's a lot, it's a much different feel. It's, it's, All right, it's so thicker a little bit. Th this right here, do you see how my pinky has nowhere to go? Mm -hmm. That's what that little grip extender does right. that my camera has. Right. Yeah, see that, that would bother yeah, so me a little let bit. Let me grip, let me, yeah, I have, to, I have the same, yeah, my, my pinky falls off the end here. Yeah, I bet you which, they make uh, one for your yeah, camera. they do, they do. I should really get one. Yeah. Um, so what I end up doing is I end up, not even realizing I'm doing it, I probably never realized I did it, is that my whole hand is up higher. So like my middle finger is closer to the shutter button, but I'm using my pointer finger to hit the button. So it's like, it's a little, I guess I'm just used to it. Yeah, it's, a little, it's a little awkward, but it would be nice to have something at the bottom where I can keep my hand lower. It's a, ni it's a nice big camera though. I mean, yeah. it's got a good feel to it. It feels a little heavier than mine. Like the, I don't know, the whole thing just feels, it's a little bigger. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's definitely nice. It's and the R5. This is, this is the this is what I wish my camera had. I wish Nikon would you know get with the program here and put this on their camera. This is really like my favorite part with the mirrorless cameras, with all the bells and whistles that the R5 has, and all the new technology that the mirrorless cameras have. The flippy screen, this little flippy screen, is for me is such such a big deal because it allows me to like to just kind of get more creative, to put the camera in weird places that I normally wouldn't put it Definitely. to get shots. I can, you know, I can put it at the end of a tripod and hold it, you know, five feet over my head and, and compose and see what I'm doing. Yeah. Or stick it like under a fence and, you know, there's, there's things that I can do with it that I wouldn't be able to do with it before. My screen articulates, but just up and down. It doesn't right. swing out, so. And you have the, the 50 millimeter 1.2? Right, 1.2. 1.2. So but I love the 50 millimeter lens. I've always loved 50 millimeters. You always millimeters, have. So, yeah. you know, the opportunity to get, like if there was one lens I was definitely getting, it was that one. I mean, this is a big lens. It's, 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 it's a, a big, big heavy lens. Heavy lens. Yeah. But a 1.2 aperture is ridiculous. This, the depth of field is so razor thin, but um, doesn't come cheap, right? No, no, that's an, this, what you're holding there is a, a very expensive setup. But yeah. that, the lens is, it's probably a $2,000 lens. Now, conversely, um, this is Canon's other 50 millimeter. Right. And this is for this mount? Yep. yep. Okay, so this is a um, RF, R mount, right? Yeah, RF 50 millimeter 1.8, which is a full stop slower than the 1.2, but look at the size of it. Yeah, I, I mean, mean it's, it's basically it's, nothing to it. It feels plasticky and right. less expensive. I mean, it feels like a cheaper right. lens. Right, it's the closest thing right now to a pancake lens that Canon has for the RF system. Uh, so that's really why I got what, it. What does this cost? Uh, 200 bucks. All right, so right. this is a good, now, is, would you recommend this with that camera, or? Um, no. Like, if you were getting started, right, you'd probably no. be better off spending your money somewhere else, right? Right, right. That, that, this lens for me is basically for if I wasn't gonna take my camera otherwise, like if I just can't walk around or carry this thing, if I was gonna be someplace where I just can't have this huge, heavy, bulky thing with me, but I just wanted to have my camera, that's the only reason that I would use that. Okay, all right, so. Let's see what else. And you know what's funny? The Nikon 150 millimeter 1.8 kind of falls in between these two in price, in right. size, right. and in quality. It's probably closer to the the more expensive. Right. And, yeah. Well, um, historically, Canon had uh, with the EF mount, it had a it still has a 50 millimeter 1.4, which is kind of the same as that as the Nikon uh, 1.8. They haven't made one an RF version of it yet, uh, but that kind of is still very high quality, better than the 1.8, uh, but just not quite as wide as the 1.2. So we're gonna go from Eric's smallest lens, which is this one, to his biggest lens, which is this one. <laughs> this lens produces the nicest really does. images that you will ever see. And uh, hopefully you'll throw some up here in this video yeah, right I'm here. Put some up here. Um, yeah, you're right, it really does. And actually when I was going through my, my oh lens God, renaissance so heavy. a couple of years ago um, to, to switch over to the RF system, I actually floated the idea of trading this lens in and he, Bill said, are you crazy? Are you, are you nuts? <laughs> yeah, he was gonna trade this in. And this, this lens, I mean, what does this cost new? Five grand? No, well, this is the Mark I version. The Mark right. II version is like $6,000, okay. that's crazy. But this I got used probably 12 years ago for a couple thousand dollars, and it's but still, I mean, just as good as this will last forever. This yeah. lens, I mean, that's it's a, got a metal a body. It, it's 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 super heavy. I mean, look at the size of the lens element. Yeah, it's tremendous. But the images are just uh, 
there's nothing comparable to this, right. I find. Like, you really... Right, you and, it, and there really is a big difference between, like, at the long end of a 70 to 200 2.8, even though this is 302.8, there really is a difference. Yeah, at the long yeah. end, not just in, not just in the reach, but the compression. It's got a and, unique uh, look, yeah. a completely right. unique look. So you mentioned the 70 to 200. So right. here is the 70 to 200. Now this is a little different than mine because when you this one extends right. So whereas mine, everything is built into the housing. This is a smaller package, so it's not as big of a lens when you're shooting with it. How do you find the quality of this thing? It's great. It's, yeah. yeah, it's great. It's better than the EF version of the 70 to 200. Um, it really is a great lens. Now, this is my only, it's not my only zoom lens, but it's the only zoom lens that I use as a zoom. Um, and I'll explain that more when we get to this one over here. But what I'm thinking about doing is, now this is a 70 to 200 2.8. I use all primes other than this. And my thinking is the reason to have this lens is for the convenience. If I'm in a situation where I need to be able to change focal lengths quickly, I need fast focusing. That's, um, it, that's it's, why it's, I have a 7200. Right. It's great I mean, for that. And if I'm using, like when we go out shooting waterfalls, I'll use that because I'm stopping down to f8 or f11. So I don't need the wide aperture for that. So it's great for that and I have more versatility. Um, but if that's what I'm using it for, if I'm using a zoom lens just for landscapes, waterfalls, uh, you know, smaller aperture things, things on a tripod, do I need 2.8? Would I be better off with a 70 to 200 f4 lens? That's lighter and smaller. Or 24 to 105 f4 lens that covers a bigger range. It's a great lens, though. I, would, I mean, <laughs> from now, I, in, the, his, in Eric's last video, he talked about, you know, zooming and moving and changing your lenses right. to get the same focal length but with a wider aperture. I like, and, and especially when you're shooting people, portraits, I like, without your subject even knowing it, you can do a close-up of someone's face and do a full body shot without them knowing it, without anything happening, and you can be interacting with your subject, and you can quickly maneuver things. You don't have to go into your bag, break the continuity right. of whatever's going on. So that's why I prefer 70 to 200. Right. I mean, these all have a place in whatever they do, but like this is a lens I would always want in my bag, yeah. and especially there, and there is, that. Especially in portraits, there is a big difference between 2.8 and 4.0. Right, so if you, like, right. if you were gonna take pictures of what, like if you had to shoot somebody for something, whatever mm -hmm. it was, you want that out of focus right. background, right? right? Right. Yeah, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a tough call. I mean, you know, you could just use this, which right. is his 135. Now this is an autofocus 135, yeah. right? Yeah. It makes things a lot easier, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, this image, this this lens produces also excellent images. I've loved the, the this is the reason why I bought my Rokinon because right. I would see the images Eric would get out of this one and uh, I would just love them. Why do you love this one so much? It's for the same reason. Yeah. I've, I've, I've had that lens for probably 15 years now and you know right out of the box from day one it was just like as, far, as soon as i started using it it was like wow this is like it's it's different it's got a very unique look to it that's it you know it's like you know the it's greater than the sum of its parts you i know, think the tone of this lens like the the there's I just something about it yeah like I, it, it, there's intangibles with lenses right. and it might sound funny but some lenses and uh they just have a look of their own and you know, I could take my 70 to 200 out, we could put the same aperture and take the picture of the same thing. They're gonna have a different look. Right. The, uh, and I have the, for, this is an EF lens, so I have the uh, EF to RF adapter. And I actually, because I change lenses so often, because I shoot prime lenses and I'm changing a lot, I, what I ended up doing is I got like three of these uh, adapters. So I have the permanently mounted on my EF lenses, this way I can change lenses. Because what I was doing the first time out was I had like three EF lenses and one RF lens, and I had one adapter. So I had well, like, I was constantly moving. That's what I'm doing now. I'm, I'm messing around with adapters, right. and it's and it's then when I'm doing it quickly, and all of a sudden I go to put a lens on, and it doesn't fit on the mount because it doesn't have the adapter. Um, it just slows down. So okay. you know the adapters are cheap enough; you can get a few of them. Okay, so to me. This is a 24 millimeter tilt shift lens. Now, I've never had a tilt shift lens. This to me is like your fisheye. You use yeah, this yeah, when you right. want to get creative. Some, like, right. well, Something I'll go to the right. fisheye, you'll pull this thing out and right. start making right. everything perfect and you bend right. the line. Like, you straighten things basically it's with more, this. It's, it's more straightening lines and evening things out um, and changing the depth of field, rotating the actual plane of focus around a little bit. Um, yeah, this is something else that I have had for probably 15 years or so. Um, and it's one of those things that every once in a while it kind of like gets left on the shelf for a few months. 
then, then when you pull it out, you're like, out, I'm like, I love this lens. It's just, right. yeah. So along with that, you have, these are both 24 millimeter lenses. Right. Why have two? Because this one is, is tilt shift, which is a whole unique thing in itself. And the other one, the 24 millimeter 1.4 lens is a, another whole unique thing in itself in that you can shoot wide open at 1.4 with a wide angle lens. What's the aperture of this one? Uh, 3.5 is the maximum. Okay. Now, do you always have to get that tilt shift effects with, effect with this or? No, no, you can just use it as a straight a you can. 24 millimeter lens, maximum aperture. So basically the difference is you're getting a wider aperture with this. Right, right. Okay. This one's manual focus also to tilt shift. Um, which really doesn't matter because when you're using that lens, you're really slowing everything down. You're being very deliberate with what you're doing, so manual focus is fine with that. But this is like what we were talking about in my bag video. Right. It's like the 24 millimeter 1.8 or 1.4 would be something right. that I would be interested in because of that wide, shallow right. depth of field. This is right. a, it's another unique look that right. kind of can differentiate you from somebody else as a photographer. Right. All right. Let's see what else we got here. Okay. And now this is your landscape lens. Right. This is an RF mount 15 millimeter. Right. Well, it's, it's a 15 to 35 zoom. Oh, okay. Now, even though it's a zoom lens, I honestly never use this as a zoom lens. It's stabilized. It's stabilized. I only use this at 15. I so this is equivalent to my 16 to 35? It's the same thing as the 16 much? to 35. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, I bought this to replace a fixed prime uh, Zeiss 15 millimeter lens, uh, which also had a 2.8 maximum aperture. This is just a better lens. And again, I had the Zeiss and I had this one now also because it takes filters. Right. It has a front uh, thread. So you can see the, filters. the lens is not right bulbous like that where it's sticking out. And that's why I have mine. Right. Because, you know, when you're shooting waterfalls in the middle, you don't want to deal with these big filter right. apparatuses. Right. Yeah, so this so is so much the way easier. To go. Even if the fil even at ultra wide at 15, if maybe at the ends you get a little bit of the, of the filter or it gets a little bit darker in the corners because you have a filter on there, you can kind of just crop it a little bit and fix it, it's not a big deal. And last but not least, your flash. All right, so this is the Canon 430EX flash. It's you a have a lot of flashes, flash. don't you? I, mean, I do have a lot of flashes. Yeah, they got a bunch See, of what them. I'm normally using, I'm normally using the 600 series. Now this is when I wanna, like if I'm shooting Bill's band and I wanna set up flashes all over that are rem remotely triggered, this is a big high powered flash. Um, but look at the size of this compared to this. You know, it's it's almost double the size. So this is good enough, right? Yeah, this is good enough. It's really, it's really is a good flash. Uh, but if I'm just, I just need to fill in some shadows. I'm taking portraits and I need to fill things in a little bit or I just need to cast a little bit of light somewhere. That works fine. But this, you can, can you use this remotely from the camera like that? Yes, you yeah, can. It's, so it's, a, it's a radio trigger. Now for these, they still haven't, I don't know why, built a radio trigger into an actual camera. You have to have a separate, Oh, this it doesn't have it built in? No, you got to mount the radio, radio trigger oh, on the top of it. Oh, I thought it was it built into the camera. fire it. So you have okay. to kind of, you know, bring that also with you. Um, is there a big price difference between these two? Yeah, this is only 250 bucks or so. So this is a good yeah. starter flash probably, yeah, right? Yeah, this, this is a great flash. I, I've also been using this little tiny one here, which I did a video about. This is a 270EX. This is basically... It's like a pop-up. Right, it's a pop-up flash. It's basically what it's it is. It's a little better than a pop-up. Yeah, it's a little bit better than a pop-up because you can actually tilt it. Oh wow, look at that. Um, it's a, a little bit better than a pop-up. But that's basically, if you if your camera doesn't have a pop-up and you want a little bit of a better flash, something like this, it's the Canon 270EX2. We really need to do a there. flash video. I mean, we don't use flash a lot. That's the problem, we really don't. Yeah, but yeah. There, are, there are some times when you just need it. And it's not when you think maybe, like you want to use it during the day, right. and, and, and you know, not necessarily at night where you want to, you know. How about a flash video for people who really don't use flash that much? Or, that's us. Yeah, <laughs> people who don't know how to use flash right. teaching you how to use flash. Uh, but yeah, no, we can get by with flash, uh, but it's something that, uh, you know, you should have at least one decent speed light in your bag, right. I would say, right? Oh yeah, definitely. You know. Um, all right. Is that all your stuff? That's all my stuff. Uh, other than tchotchkes and accessories and things like right. that. Oh, I want to show you bag? Oh yeah, my, the bag. So I'm, I've always been a messenger bag guy, carried across the body. Well, I have my bag too. A lot of them there. Um, this year, 2021 is the year of the backpack for me. I tried this out in the fall That's on our, uh, on one of our, I don't know, when I, when I, did I take this on a waterfall trip? No. No, you were you working out. It was after there. the waterfall trip that, which almost killed me, carrying a messenger bag around with all my stuff on these long hikes, that I finally converted. Not converted, trying out the backpack, but I love it so far. It's a low yeah, pro, uh, BP three fifty AW. 
uh, which is a really nice bag. It's I did very a review structured. on it here. Yeah, it's very it's big and boxy. It's definitely a camera bag. It doesn't look like, you know, Bill's is a little more sleek. Well, it looks like a backpack. Yeah, this, this one is small. You, you know, I, I've had, about six, seven years ago, I bought a cheap bag off of Amazon. It was $45. And I've been using that bag for the last seven years. And it was fine. Yeah. So I said to myself when it was time to buy another bag, I don't know, everybody's looking at these think tanks and right. low pro and this and that. And they're so expensive. And I'm like, you know what? Let me see if I can get another cheap bag and just see how it is. So this one is uh, some off-brand ESDDI. I'm not really sure where it comes from, whatever. It was $69 on Amazon. And it actually is a good bag. Like I, yeah. I, you know, I have no issues with this. It fits all my gear in it. Um, it's got the removable, you know, Velcro, you know, uh, spacer, so you can adjust it any yeah. way you want. It's comfortable. Um, it's got a spot for a water bottle. It's got a tripod thing on the side. It's got a, you know, with a weatherproof bag that goes over it. So for $69, I said, I'll try it and see right. how it goes. And yeah. so far, so good. Yeah. The hard thing with buying bags is you just, you don't know how, if they're big enough. Even if you're in the store getting it, like yeah. you, you don't have you all get your home, gear with it. As soon as you start putting your stuff in it, you're like, oh, no, I, there's no way I'm going to fit my yeah. stuff in here. I, I do like a messenger bag, though. If I'm going out with a camera, two lenses and a flash, Yes. like if I was going to do a portrait shoot for somebody or right. when I was going uh, a few months ago shooting some restaurant stuff, mm -hmm. that was a great bag to have because I could keep it on me and I could quickly move around right. and I only needed a couple of lenses and it wasn't like I didn't have to have 50 things with me. Right. So that was great. And uh, I liked working out of that, where a backpack would have been cumbersome and clumsy. Yeah. So you kind of have to know how you're going to use the bag pretty yeah. much. Once you get a feel for it, you know where everything is in a bag and you can be engaging or doing whatever you need to do while your other hand is grabbing stuff out of the bag and changing lenses or getting accessories. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. All right. So there you have it. There's the second half of our what's in your bag right. video. Right. We'll uh, do another one of these in another six months or so to update. My bag is going to stay the way it is right now. I just <laughs> spent so much money on gear that I was, I was, my whole plan was to get a, a Z5 and just adapt right. everything I had. And here I am with new lenses, a mm -hmm. different camera, the whole thing. Nothing went to plan. Yeah. I don't know that there's anything new Canon RF coming out until the fall anyway. Uh, so really, there's really probably going to be nothing. So this is our 2021 what's in our bags. Yeah, now we uh, got to go out and uh, take some good pictures actually with it. Go out and use it, yeah. Beautifying. I actually want to go back into Brooklyn and mm -hmm. now that I have the Z6 II, right. and I wanted to get a little warmer because that last time was ridiculous, <laughs> and go in there and uh, do some cityscapes and things like that and try out all the lenses in different situations, maybe go into the city. It's a great environment to try out all your gear because there's so many things to take pictures of. Right. So, you know, we'll see. Yep. All right. Cool. I uh, hope you enjoyed this. A little conversational. We're, you know, trying something different today. And uh, so we uh, will see you in the next video. Yeah. Thanks for watching.